Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about how many people in the United States have been dying for no good reason. Our guest, Jacob Bohr, is one of the authors of a new study that assesses how many U.S. deaths would be avoided every year if the U.S.'s mortality rate were equal to that of other wealthy peer nations. Jacob Bohr is an assistant professor in the departments of global health and epidemiology at Boston University School of Public Health. Jacob Bohr, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thanks so much, David. It's it's a pleasure to be here. So what did you study and what did you find? Yeah, so our our paper, which, um, which was recently published in PNAS Nexus, uh, compares U.S. mortality rates with those in other wealthy nations. And, um, you know, there have been a number of studies that have looked at changes in life expectancy in the U.S. And some of your listeners may have seen in the news that U.S. life expectancy declined uh, year on year over year between about 2014 and 2018, and then further declined during the COVID pandemic. And what we were interested in was putting putting these data into per, into a longer term perspective. When did these declines begin? When did the divergence of the U.S. from other nations begin? And can we look at it using a metric different from life expectancy, one that really captures the the, the actual number of lives that are being lost due to excess mortality in the U.S.? So you've got numbers as well as percentages and comparisons. Uh, what are what are some of the numbers? Yeah, so we can we can we can dive into that. I mean, what what we did in this study was we looked from 1933, which is when the mortality type uh, data series began, through 2021 into the second year of the COVID pandemic. We care, we compared the U.S. with 21 other wealthy nations, largely European nations, plus Japan, Australia, and New Zealand, and we looked at the average mortality rates in those other nations. So not just comparing the U.S. against the top performers comparing the U.S. against against the average. If the U.S. was just average, how would we be doing? What we found is that in 2021, there were over 1 million excess deaths in the U.S. relative to what there would have been if the U.S. had mortality rates of other wealthy nations. We saw the same thing in 2020. And, you know, this is during the COVID pandemic. There have been quite a number of papers and reports about excess mortality in the U.S. during COVID relative to what came before in the U.S., during COVID and showing that, yes, there was this spike uh, in 2020 and 2021. What, we sh- what, what we're comparing against is not U.S. mortality you know, before COVID, but against mortality in other wealthy nations and showing that even in other places that experienced the COVID pandemic, we experienced it so much worse in terms of mortality impact that there was a million in excess U.S. deaths in 2020 and 1.1 million excess deaths in 2021. Well, part of what was so interesting was, you know, this didn't start with COVID, right? This is, even if you look in 2019, there were over 600,000 excess U.S. deaths that would not have occurred if the U.S. had the age-specific mortality rates of these other wealthy nations. And when did this start, if you go back through the years and the decades, and when you say U.S. diverged from other wealthy nations, are the other wealthy nations all very similar in a pack, or are they spread out considerably? Yeah, it's it's, it's a good question. So, you know, there are the different phases of the historical record. And so, you know, we're starting 1933, which is the Depression and World War II and the aftermath of World War II. You can imagine in Japan and in Europe, uh, mortality rates were very high during World War II and during its aftermath, there's lots of malnutrition, et cetera. So the U.S. looks good relative to these other countries in, in that era. In the 60s and 70s, the U.S. is really in the middle of the pack, um, and, 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 and we do see a pack. I mean, we do see uh, in the earliest uh, decades of this time series, we see countries like Portugal, which were really, you know, still developing countries at, at, that, at that point, which had much higher mortality rates. Um, but by the 60s and 70s, there is, there is a pack. The U.S. is in the middle of the pack. And what happens starting in around 1980 is that the you know, these countries, wealth, wealthy countries continue to see mortality declines. And the U.S. sees mortality declines, but the decline is it, the decline is much slower. 
And so you see in the early 80s, this, this beginnings of this divergence of the US from the rest of the pack. And it, and it, and it happens you know, year after year after year, such that you know, in, in, in the mid 70s, the US, United States is right there in the middle. And then by the mid 80s, you know, it's 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 doing worse than um, you know it's 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 doing it's doing uh, worse than the average. And by 2000, it's doing worse than all but just a couple of countries. And by 2010, it's the worst in terms of all cause mortality rates. You know, and and and, and so you know you see the U.S. diverging from the average, but also becoming a true outlier. And the U.S. is really exceptional in our mortality experience, and it's also exceptional in how young people are dying. It's not just higher mortality rates, but higher mortality rates, particularly at younger and working ages. 1980 really seems like a key year, uh, apart from and perhaps related to the election of Ronald Reagan uh, and, you know, U.S. presidents no longer really pretending to give a damn, but uh, in terms of wealth inequality, in terms of uh, of all sorts of statistics on well-being, on in terms of of things like labor union membership, I mean, lots of trends in U.S. politics, society, economy. We're really getting better. Uh, the, the the money that people are making in comparison to the money that they are generating for. The corporations they work for is you know is going up until 1980 and then it's going down what what are you, what lessons are you able to draw here in terms of of causation so i you know i, I want to be careful around uh, uh, around causal inferences here the study wasn't specifically designed with that intent but i i think you know certainly there are a lot of trends that coincide with these mortality trends that I think are very likely to be part of this story. Okay, and so I, I think a couple of the things that you mentioned, which I'll pull out here, you know, certainly the rise in income inequality. We know that, you know, income is very strongly correlated with life with life expectancy. As you have widening income income uh, inequality, you have, um, you, you know, you you, you have, um, you know, worse and worse, uh, you know, health sort of at the bottom of the income distribution. And so that is going to be part of this. Um, another piece of this has to do with the precarity of work and changes in the economy and the types of jobs that people have access to, moving from sort of people able to have a sort of blue collar career, uh, you know, in say manufacturing to the kind of precarious work that people are doing now, driving Uber or delivering for Amazon, et cetera. You know, that's not, it's very hard to think of oneself as having a career in that in that space, and that has implications for how people think about their lives and 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 uh, health behaviors, et, et, et cetera, as well. You know, I, I think also certainly there's a there's really been a shift where in the last forty years, you know, if I can use the you know if I can use the word in the sort of neoliberal regime, so many of the determinants of health have been distributed in the market rather than through government. Right, so the things that that, that that determine whether you're healthy, not just medical care, although we see that too, obviously, um, but things like healthy food, things like where you can live and can you do, are you able to live near a park? Things like, are you able to have a job that, you know, where it's a safe place to work? We learned a lot about that during COVID, about who is able to work in a safe place and who is not able to work in a safe place. It was almost like the country rediscovered class you know, all of a sudden, in the way that it intersected with, with with public health in terms of what people had access to, had access to, you know, and 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 all of these are basically being allocated in in the market these determinants of health rather than being provided by government as sort of rights or, enti or, or entitlements, and that changes for the elderly, right? And in, amongst the elderly, where they have social security and Medi Medicare, is where we actually see the smallest differences between the US and between other countries. You know, it really is in the kind of young, uh, early working age adulthood ages that we see the, 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 the largest differences. So there are a number of these factors, both on the policy side and the economy side and the rising income inequality side that have definitely contributed to, to, uh, to, to these trends. So is, first of all, is infant mortality a factor here or is that sort of factored out? It is part of these numbers. Uh, we we don't see, um, you know, in terms of changes over in terms of changes over time, 
we actually didn't separate out, separate out the infants from other from other children. So it's not it's not, it's not something that we look at we look at specifically. But what you're noticing is not that this is largely due to infant mortality or children's deaths or deaths among the elderly, but it's but it's young adults. So it's not it's not a few people dying very early, and it's not right. a huge number of people dying slightly earlier. It's somewhere in between there. That's that's right, and and I think I think you're, you're raising a um, it's 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 a it's, it's a great question because it gets to how do we interpret life expectancy when you look at uh, when 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 you look at sort of U.S. life expectancy is seventy six years or, or the, the, this this sort of thing. I think often when we talk about life expectancy, people aren't sure how to interpret it. Where are these deaths actually happening? Right? If you say life expectancy dropped from seventy eight to seventy seven. People think, okay, that's a, that's a change in one year at the end of my life. That 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 sort of thing. And what we're able to show by looking really at at every age, and looking at the number of lives that are lost at each in each age group in excess of what would have been lost uh, under peer country mortality rates. You know, it really is you know 15 to 64, which is sort of the you know prime adulthood and working ages where where the biggest differences are. Um, just for you know another couple of numbers, you know, we find that. Um, and this one really, I had to kind of get up from my computer for, <laughs> for a moment, go for a walk to get my, my head right around this. But we find that, you know, half of all deaths under 65 would be averted if the U.S. had the age-specific mortality rates of our peer countries. So I, I know multiple people who've died before age 65, but I'd like to have half of them back in my life, right? So, you know, I, I think everybody can sort of relate to this as a, you know, as 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 an as an experience, and um, that was just shocking to me that you know our our under sixty five mortality rate is twice as high as what it is, it is in these other countries. And during the pandemic, um, ninety percent of the increase in under sixty five mortality that we saw would have been avoided. So, like our increase in under sixty five mortality during the pandemic was almost ten times higher than what was seen in other wealthy nations. And I, I think this goes. This really points to our failure in this country, our inability in this country to protect the lives of young and working people, or at least our decision not to. I don't want to say we're not able to, but our decision not to, our decision to, um, you know, uh, on, on a policy front, to not really protect and by revealed preference to not really care about the lives of, 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 of so many, so many younger people. And, um, I, I, that's, that's, uh, that was a, a, a tough one to swallow as an American, um, looking at those data. Yeah, there, there have to be a lot of factors, uh, including ordinary mundane things, but also you have a major disaster recently in a place like Hawaii, and you see a few coins tossed there while just absolute truckloads are being driven into uh, the black hole of the Pentagon, uh, and you wonder about about priorities. Um, there, there does not seem to be a priority on making the United States a place where people who happen to be born here or move here can have a higher chance of having those extra two, three, four decades of life. Yeah. No, I think that's I think that's absolutely right. And in, in the, you know, these we're looking in aggregate, right? And we're looking by race, ethnicity, because that's what, that's that's how the data are available. Um, but, you know, it, these are not, these mortality risks are not evenly distributed across society and not by a long shot, right? It is people who have less than a college education. It is people living in poverty. It is people living in rural areas often, but not not, not exclusively. It is people who are unstably housed? It is people who um, are uh, are immigrants and don't have documentation or or, or, or uh, legal status. It is people, Native Americans and Black Americans, who have been, you know, the the um, who who have been whose mortality experience for centuries has been shaped by structural racism. I mean, if we look at the fifteen to forty four age group. Native Americans have mortality rates that are eight times higher than 
the average in other wealthy nations. And for Black Americans, it's five times. For white yeah. Americans, it's three times. So you know, this is it, it's um, these these are these are these are numbers that 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 both convey that we are all in this together in the sense that we all live through this policy regime, policy regime, but um, it doesn't affect us all all equally, right? And there's there's very good data that. If you're at the high end of the income distribution, it doesn't matter that much what the policy environment is. Like you're going to be fine. If you're at the low in end of the income distribution, uh, low, low, low end of the income distribution, distribution, it matters a, a great deal where you live. And I think you know. So what we're seeing is not just a disregard for health in the U.S., but very specifically a disregard for the health of working class people in the U.S. and a disregard for um, for the health of immigrants, for the health of Black and Native people in in, in the U.S., and um, you know that's going to take that's going to take more than a single policy to to address for sure. The other day, I I spent more time than I should on Twitter or whatever they call it now, and Congressman Raul Grijalva, one of the supposedly best progressive Congress members, was tweeting about how. Uh, members of the US military have earned the right to some health care and some education. And so we need to pass a bill to give them a little more health care and education. And I replied, in decent countries, don't people earn all of those rights by being born and then maybe not lose them by participating in somebody's crazy murder spree, but other people don't lose them either? Like, wouldn't single payer health coverage, like in other wealthy countries, make a world of difference here? Absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, the, the we've seen it through Medicaid expansion that that has made a very material and important difference to the health and survival of low income people. And Medicaid expansion isn't isn't ubiquitous. Um, you know, there are states that still haven't expanded. In places that have expanded after the pandemic, people were booted off the rolls because they, you know, you have to you have to stay eligible and keep proving your eligibility, and especially. In states that aren't too keen to to have people on their Medicaid rolls, they make it pretty hard for people to stay on, you know. And 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 that's for people who are eligible for Medicaid. There's plenty of people who are not quite eligible for Medicaid, but really need support or are spending an arm and a leg going into bankruptcy because they don't have um, adequate in, insurance for for the you know for the medical costs that 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 they're facing, you know. But the healthcare system is is just part of the story, right? And it's also it's it's our bizarre attitude towards a legal environment around firearms, which is a complete outlier relative to other wealthy nations. Um, I mean, the, the, the number of deaths by fire, firearms relative to other na wealthy nations is like two orders of magnitude higher. I mean, it's it's just um, it's just bizarre. There's, there's <laughs> um, you know, it, it's it's the, the 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 growth of the opioid epidemic here, and and um, so-called sort of deaths of despair related to uh, economic dislocation and people, um, sort of the, the the unraveling that happens when when work disappears, right? Both in urban environments, to quote you know William Julius Wilson in the early eighties, and 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 more recently in um, and in in sort of you know upper Midwest towns and small cities manufacturing towns um, so there's a lot of these pieces that are that are that are driving this driving this story over time um, I think part of what jumped out at us was this common denominator that it does seem to be younger people that are disproportionately affected in the US and that happened before the pandemic and it happened during the pandemic it does seem to be disproportionately black and native people, Although whites also with a very with a significantly excess significant excess mortality both before and then during the during the pandemic, it does seem to be low income people people with less and people with less than a college degree both before and during the pandemic. So, you know, in some ways, when we look at COVID, there's a ten, there's a tendency to say, okay, well now that we have a vaccine, we're done and it's over. But you know, if anything, COVID really showed how vulnerable we are to all kinds of excess risks. And obviously that that's a new pathogen that was COVID appeared in the US just as, as it appeared in 
you know, in, in the UK and, and in Germany and Australia. Um, so it's not about a new pathogen. It's about the tinderbox that we have here in the US um, of social inequalities and the gaps in our sort of policy environment, both in health and the social sector that really make people vulnerable. And I, I think that I think that there was a bit of an awakening during the pandemic. And my fear of exiting the pandemic is that we'll forget those lessons. Um, and I sort of fear that we've already we've already forgotten them. And there's a lot of work to do. <laughs> when did the United States ever learn a lesson? Might oh, be yeah. shorter uh, <laughs> interview, but. Uh, we talk about comparing these rates, mortality rates in the United States, life expectancy in the United States with other wealthy countries. What about non-wealthy countries? I think the United States falls below countries, and, and this may start to change as many non-wealthy countries are also disproportionately impacted by climate collapse. But as of this moment, the United States doesn't soar above all the non-wealthy countries in life expectancy, does it? Oh, yeah, not at all. We're well below Costa Rica. We're well below. I mean, there's a number of sort of middle income countries that do, do better. China. Than, uh, China. The, and that's on average. You know, when you look at specific U.S. subgroups, um, we were, were recently doing the calculations for another, another paper. Life expectancy amongst Native Americans is lower than life expectancy in Afghanistan. So, you know, just... Just, 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 just for some some perspective, you know, it's it's um, we have we have mortality crises here at at home that require quite a quite a lot of our attention, and um, you know, <laughs> but the <laughs> poorest country in the world, Afghanistan, is one of the poorest and been bombed for twenty years. Exactly, exactly. I mean. It, it, you know, in, in if we spent the amount of money that we spent in Afghanistan in the last, you know, in, in the last 25 years on the health of Native people, we'd be in a pretty, pretty different situation. Be doing pretty darn well. I, I, I want to ask you, I don't know if you've studied this, but what you think U.S. public opinion is and awareness of the facts is on this, because I, uh, some years back, I wrote a book called Curing Exceptionalism, and I tried to find something where the U.S. was exceptionally good. And I couldn't find anything. It trailed most wealthy countries in most everything good and many non-wealthy countries in many things good. Uh, and yet in US public opinion of itself, it was just about the opposite. Uh, so I wondered, do, do, do people know what you're telling them? Uh, will they learn what you're, you're telling them? Has there been any response to your, to your report? I love the title of your book, by the way, um, it's, it seems like if, if the if the subtitle to our paper could have been "Dying from Exceptionalism," you know, your book offers the antidote in in terms right. of exceptionalism. The um, it's been met with surprise. Um, I've received a number of personal emails from people who just you know, who, who, who read it or read some of the coverage of, of, the, of the paper. And um, there were a couple of nice sort of long, for, there's a long form piece in the Atlantic, which was, which was nice. That was, was Ed Young wrote uh, last summer that I would refer readers to, which beautifully written. And then a, a recent piece that uh, David Wallace Wells wrote in the, in the New York Times on, on, on the, on the paper. Um, and so partly sort of in response to those, which was kind of getting the message out there a bit, more, I'd received some some notes from uh, private notes from, from 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 people talking about experiences that they had had or people that they'd known who had died too young, and that kind of recognition that at least at a statistical level, these are avoidable deaths, right? And and, and that that kind of really, especially where people had specific personal experiences to connect statistics to there was real a, a real sense of um that their own personal heart heartache was actually generalized and i think that that's actually an interesting an interesting piece to this is that look we often mourn privately we don't mourn publicly we don't have you know if the, mourn publicly if you have a, a large natural disaster or 
terrorist event or something like this where it's something that's visible but for something like this where it's not visible it's one person dying over here someone dying in their home someone dying in the hospital in the nursing home it becomes much harder right and so i i think i don't think the general public has any i it has really any idea about how poorly the U.S. is doing relative to other countries, and it's really why we wrote the paper, um, is to is to help sort of dramatize this and why I appreciate the attention that, that you're bringing to it. Um, I think my own perspective is that a lot of the the literature here that focuses on life expectancy sort of undersells this difference a bit because it looks it's like just a year or two and maybe late in life for the lay public, and 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 so I think you know. Half of all deaths under 65 could be averted if we just were doing as well as the average of other countries. To me, that kind of thing hits home, right? Or we could save a million lives if we adopted policies each year, if we adopted policies that could look more like looked more like our peers. To me, these kinds of lessons hit home. And we'd actually like to see this because we've had you know, fairly good positive responses from folks in, in interest on, on amongst progressives and folks on the left. I'd be very interested to hear from folks on the right about what their explanations are for, you know, falling life expectancy, for rising mortality amongst the very populations that many of them are are are, are representing, you know, in um, in in this country. And so I think there's a a big conversation that we need to have as a country about the missing Americans. And I hope that this um, that this article can be a start to that. Well, some may reply completely falsely that the United States is targeted by terrorist attacks, which you mentioned a minute ago. But you watch and see whether the people who just died in Hawaii are memorialized and glorified as if they had died at Pearl Harbor. I mean, they're incidents are treated differently from other incidents. But uh, we have just a minute or two left. Uh, we'll put a link on talkworldradio.org to the paper, but is there any place that people should go to learn more that, that you recommend that people should do? Uh, and what are you doing next? Yeah, I mean, so for, for the, there's, there's a, a very in-depth report from the National Academy of Sciences that actually two reports that came out um, over the last uh, 10, 15 years. And I can send you the links so you can put those on the, uh, so, so you can link to those, which provides her the, the 150 page versions of this. If people really wanna get into the weeds of these mortality differences and those predate COVID. So we're sort of in our paper, we're updating this for COVID, um, but that provides some of the foundation for the work here. Um, we also, I was involved in a Lancet the Journal of the Lancet has, has these commissions, and we it was involved in the, the Lancet Commission on Public Health and Policy in the Trump era, which released their report in February 2021, and I'll uh, send that link as, as well for some more background reading on this. I think in taking this forward, we have some specific work looking at the causes of death that explain these differentials. So what are the specific causes that are leading to you know, the U.S. having such higher mortality rates relative to other countries. And Not about 30 and, seconds. Yeah, and so I, I think that, that that work will help us to, you know, signal where should we be focusing our attention. But I, I think the final and, and, and really interesting question is um, how to engage the lay public on this topic. And that's why I sort of really appreciate your, your prior question, because I think if we understood how exceptional we were in terms of mortality deficit, uh, survival deficits, in terms of excess mortality, that seems like a first step to doing something about it and to holding our policymakers accountable and responsible. Very well said, Jacob Bohr from Boston University School of Public Health. Thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. It's a pleasure to speak with you, David. Thanks so much. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.